Whose works do you mention of when you talk about art? The Last Supper by Leonardo da Vinci, The Starry Night by Vincent van Gogh, Les Demoiselles d'Avignon by Pablo Picasso. There are really too many great male artists whose works are firmly remembered by us. So, what about female artists? I will say Frida Kahlo. Oh. Yayoi Kusama's Pumpkin. In fact, we have Mary Cassatt, Artemisia Gentileschi, Georgia O'Keeffe, you may have seen these artworks or are familiar with these female artists even though you may never know about them. Women typically aren't the initial individuals that come to mind when discussing the topic of art. Let's look at the data. 51% of visual artists in the United States are women. Still, only 13% of art museum acquisitions are works by women artists. Less than 10% of the artists represented were women despite women comprising over 50% of art school graduates at the time. Only 12.6% of the artists in major galleries in 2020 were women. Well, think over, if women really are equal to men, why have there never been any great women artists, composers, mathematicians, or philosophers, or so few of the same? People try to answer this question saying there are no great women artists because women are incapable of greatness. Even though people admit that everyone should be considered equal, women still have not achieved as much of special significance in the visual arts. But this is an answer that blames women themselves. Or people start digging up examples of worthy or insufficiently appreciated women artists throughout history accepts its assumptions and limitations only reinforces the belief that women cannot produce great art. People point that female artists are greatness, there is just having a different kind of greatness for women's art than for men's. They identify common qualities of femininity to link female artists and apply exclusionary stereotypes of inward-looking, delicate, and nuanced to women artists. However, when we mention the tag of inward-looking, Redden is the best choice. Corot is the representation of a more subtle and nuanced handling of pigment. There is nothing fragile about Rosa Benur's horse fair. Again, why have there been no great women artists? If we cannot find an answer to a particular question, we should consider who is creating this question and their reasons for doing so. It is usually in the hands of those in power to formulate and define the problem. Americans describe the issue they created in Vietnam and Cambodia as the East Asian problem. A similar paradox occurs with white supremacy, understood as a black problem. The powerful people design problems. The same inverse logic turns up in formulating the women's problem. This question comes from the inherent bias against women in our social environment and system. As John Stuart Mill pointed out more than a century ago, Everything which is usual appears natural. The subjection of women to men being a universal custom, any departure from it quite naturally appears unnatural. In the context of the entrenched social order, the question why have there been no great women artists is the tip of an iceberg of misinterpretation. The field of art is even a small branch of many disciplines. We need to figure out what's hiding under the water. great artists are interpreted as geniuses as if they had this absolute gift for art from birth. The Italian Renaissance painter Michelangelo is often seen as a towering figure in art history. The popular perception of Michelangelo is that he was born with a natural talent for art and that his ability to create such masterpieces as the Sistine Chapel ceiling or the Statue of David was simply a result of this innate genius. And Vincent van Gogh is often presented as a tortured genius. People are obsessed with exploring Van Gogh's personal life and experience. His biography and psychology add a more personal touch and appeal to his work. However, if this is true history, it is a little too romantic, which likes the process of creating genius. In fact, Michelangelo was trained in art from a young age and spent years studying the techniques and styles of other artists before developing his unique style. He was also supported by a network of patrons and assistants who helped him to realize his vision. There were many challenges in Van Gogh's life, but, he had a supportive family who encouraged his artistic pursuits, and his brother Theo provided him with financial and emotional support throughout his life. 
great artists are inevitably influenced by their families. As Nikolaus Pevsner points out in his discussion of the French Academy in the 17th and 18th centuries, the transmission of the artistic profession from father to son was considered a matter of course. Indeed, sons of academicians were exempted from the customary fees for lessons. When we talk about why there are no great artists in terms of social class, Linda Nochlin gives us a very vivid analogy, which is why aren't there great artists from the nobility? While aristocrats traditionally are the main patrons and audience for art, they have generally made little contribution to the production of art itself, despite having more than their share of educational advantages, leisure time, and encouragement to pursue artistic interests. Is it because aristocratic families don't have talent as artists? Of course not, society's expectation of an aristocrat is not to be a painter. In the same way, society's requirement for women has never been to be great artists. The traditional expectation of a woman could be submitting to her man and loving him unconditionally. The lack of great women artists is not a result of any inherent limitations of women but rather due to the social structures and institutions that have historically excluded or limited their participation in the art world. Female artists were rejected for using the nude model from the Renaissance to the late 19th century. Few women painters depicted the nude or with the human body because they never learned. In Zoffany's painting of the life class at the Royal Academy, 1772, all the distinguished members are present standing around two nude male models. There is one noteworthy exception. There was a single female member in there. Can you find her? See, for propriety's sake, she is merely present in effigy, in the form of a portrait hanging on the wall. She is the renowned Angelica Kaufman. This photograph by Thomas Aikens of about 1885 reveals artists at the Pennsylvania Academy using a cow as a model, because they were not allowed to draw from a human nude. We can't confirm the sex of the cow, but apparently, it's a naked cow. The academic educational system's lack of recognition of female artists was an important factor. Even in 19th century France, the country with the highest proportion of female artists, female artists were still not allowed to participate in the prestigious Prix de Rome. Their works of art could only be promoted to a small extent in the women artists' salon. They couldn't succeed, not because they weren't good enough, but because they didn't have the road to success. Even in the face of a lack of encouragement, educational opportunities, and rewards, in the 19th century etiquette books, women's achievement has never been defined as a real achievement but rather a proper achievement. Proper means that women should focus on the family and husband and maintain a humble and amateurish attitude towards other hobbies. The Family Monitor and Domestic Guide, a popular advice book published before the mid-19th century, warned women against trying too hard to excel in any one thing. Anything that occupies a woman's mind, draws her thoughts away from others and fixates them on herself should be avoided as evil. Women are trapped within the narrow definition of feminine mystique. Betty Friedan coined the term in her 1963 book. The feminine mystique refers to the idealized image of women as housewives and mothers. It denied women their full humanity and potential. The feminine mystique was a myth used to justify women's oppression and deny them the opportunity to pursue their own interests and goals. As a result, when a woman works in the arts, the amateurism and lack of real commitment in the hobby of art and the snobbery and emphasis on fashion have fostered disdainful reception by successful, professional men with real careers. Such contempt is reflected in Emily Mary Osborne's painting Nameless and Friendless. A art dealer looks at the girl's painting with an arrogant attitude and gaze, while two ogling male art lovers look on, which made the girl feel awkward. We don't see her pride and confidence in her paintings. In the past, female artists must, in any case, have had a strong streak of rebellion against the socially approved role of wife and mother in order to make her way in the art world rather than submitting to the only role to which every social institution consigns her automatically. Rosa Benour was a French painter and sculptor, known for her realistic depictions of animals and her pioneering role as a female artist in the 19th century. Benour's breakthrough came in 1849 when she exhibited her painting The Horse Fair at the Paris Salon. 
was a critical and commercial success and earned Benur international recognition. In 1865, Benur became the first woman to receive the Legion of Honor. Benur's art was widely admired for its technical skill and realistic depictions of animals. She became one of the most popular artists of her time and her work was collected by many prominent figures, including Queen Victoria and Ulysses S. Grant. Her success reflects the opportunities brought about by social aesthetic changes and the pride of successful women deviates from society's expectations for Wong. During the mid-19th century in France, tastes shifted towards smaller paintings of everyday subjects. The whites suggest that animal painting was in fashion, and Benoît was the most accomplished and successful practitioner. Rosa Benoît showed a strong spirit of independence and wore pants and short hair, which led her to be labeled a tomboy. She rejected marriage because she feared that a relationship would cause her to lose her independence. These traits did not make her more confident and assertive. In order to avoid scrutiny and criticism by society, she said the short hair and pants were just for work convenience. And when faced with the questioning of non-feminine dress, she constantly emphasized that her heart is completely feminine, which became her guise to protect herself from judgment. When a female artist has won many awards and is sought after by nobles in business, but her unconventional behavior and the accolade of worldly success still condemned her for not being a feminine woman. Historically, women have been prevented from achieving artistic excellence or success on equal footing with men due to institutional barriers rather than individual ability. The institutional barriers are present in society's expectation for women to maintain a feminine mystique, women being denied opportunities such as access to nude models, and female artists cannot participate in official competitions. While successful female artists exist, their achievements are often limited by the societal norms of their time, and they may even downplay their success. The real issue was not that there were no great women artists, but rather that they were historically invisible, unknown, and fewer in number than men because of systematic obstruction to education, patronage, and opportunities to exhibit art. Fortunately, women's social status incremental change has occurred over centuries, female students gaining the right to study nude modeling. Society has a wider recognition of gender, identity, empowerment. However, looking at the current museum, the status of female artists is still not optimistic. A study found that 87% of artists in U.S. museum collections are male. Influenced by Nochlin's article, the Women's Caucus organized a protest in front of the MoMA in 1984 when only 13 women out of 169 contemporary artists were invited to exhibit at the MoMA. They are called the Guerrilla Girls. The mission of them is bringing attention to women artists and artists of color and exposing the domination of white males in the art establishment. More and more people are gathering to tell everyone, the fault lies not in our stars, our hormones, our menstrual cycles, but in our institutions and our education.